So in the previous video, we were discussing how Japan had, um, under the threat of Western imperialism, had managed to adopt the political, economic, industrial, and scientific revolutions that gave Western countries the power that enabled them to um, go out and colonize other countries to become empires. And also they had got some of these ideas of civilization and enlightenment, social Darwinism um, from those Western empires and had also developed this idea of, of Asianism as well. Now, um, this, I don't wanna to go too much into Japanese history, but basically what happened was in 1868 in Japan, there was a massive change in government from the Shogun, a kind of military dictator who ruled Japan, being pushed aside for um, the restoration of the Meiji Emperor. So you, and uh, he was restored by these radical nationalists who were willing to really transform Japan completely in order to develop. And one thing that they wanted to do was to get Korean recognition of their new government. So very soon after the Meiji Restoration, which happened in 1868, they went to see um, or sent like an embassy to Korea and said, hey, we had this change in government um, and we want you to recognize that. And the Koreans looked at the Japanese and said, you know what? you guys are wearing Western clothing and um, you're, you, you're telling us about this change of government that's rather different um, from the government you used to have. And this government you want us to recognize, um, you have this guy called the Meiji Emperor and you're claiming he's equal to the Chinese Emperor. And that's just not how things work, right? You're not equal to China. And so the Koreans refused to recognize this new uh, government. And there was in fact then uh, a debate within Japan, um, the Japanese government in 1873, whether they should punish or even conquer Korea because of what they considered to be a kind of an, aff an affront to their um, the dignity of their, their emperor and in this refusal to accept um, and recognize this new government. Now, in the end, um, it was decided that Japan was too weak to attempt to conquer Korea. So they, they didn't try and conquer Korea at this point. Now, um, this doesn't mean that Japan was not concerned with what was going on in Korea. It certainly was. Uh, they just had decided not to conquer Korea at this time. Now, in order to address the kind of complex relationship, this kind of diplomatic impasse that Japan had with Korea, it was decided to provoke an incident with Korea that the Japanese government could then use as leverage to um, force Korea to enter into a modern relationship with Japan. So basically what happened was a group of, uh, of naval vessels, Japanese naval vessels, sailed very closely to Kanghua Island. Uh, and there's fortresses there, there's Korean fortresses on Kanghua Island at the time, because Kanghua Island defended the entry into the Han River, and that is where Seoul is, right? So if someone takes over Kanghua Island, they could actually invade Seoul very easily from the, the, uh, the ocean. The Japanese ships um, approached provocatively the Kanghua Island forts um, and ignored orders to um, desist their approach, to retreat. And so the Koreans, um, seeing this as a violation of their territorial waters, fired on the Japanese vessels. The Japanese attacked the forts in response. And though the Koreans fought bravely, the Japanese had modern weapons and the Koreans did not. And so the Japanese were able to seize the forts. Now, Japan's purpose here was not to conquer Korea. Rather, Japan wanted to force Korea to reestablish regular diplomatic relations with Japan, right? They wanted Korea um, to be able to recognize their new government and also to increase their influence in Korea through those regular diplomatic relations. Uh, remember, it, uh, Japan has becoming a, uh, following these revolutions. It wants to get access to Korean resources and it wants to find markets for its goods, for example. And it also wants to increase its own influence in Japan while decreasing Chinese influence. And in particular, what it wants Korea to do um, is to be recognized um, and to recognize itself as an independent country. Now, Korea had been an independent country. Um, Korea was always pretty much an independent country. Um, it had its own diplomacy, its own army, its own money. Um, so it pretty much was independent. It's just that it had recognized um, China as its overlord. And this made sense in pre-modern diplomatic relations, but in modern diplomatic relations, you don't have this kind of system. All nation states are the theoretically equal. So Japan wanted to increase its influence in Korea. That meant decreasing Chinese influence, which meant 
making sure that it was clear that Korea was an independent country uh, that was entirely separate from from um, China, which of course it was, uh, but Japan wanted this set in particularly modern terms. Now, Korea was threatened with invasion uh, by Japan if it did not accomplish, uh, did not accept a treaty that would accomplish all this. So, uh, and at the time there was this new king, uh, King Kojong. He had been king before, but he finally got old enough to actually rule, and he was willing to accept such a treaty. Right? He was a little bit more open than his father, who had ruled um, through him earlier. Uh, was open to the the West and to foreign countries. But the key thing is this, in a sense, happened through force, right? Korea was threatened with invasion if it didn't accept a treaty that would accomplish these Japanese goals. And what's especially clear, and this is um, this is going to be something Japan will continuously repeat, and it was very important for An Chung-gun, Japan was constantly saying Korea was an independent country. And that makes it problematic later on when Korea is going, or when Japan is going to be colonizing Korea. And one thing I just want to note here, and this is where we have to be careful about, you know, just, just criticizing and blaming Japan. This is what Japan did here was very similar to what the United States had done to Japan, right? We had sailed um, in, in 1853 and 54 and said, hey, you need to open the country and you need to do this and that, or else we're going to use our superior military power to make your life difficult. That's essentially what Japan had, um, is doing to Korea here. So Japan, in a sense, had learned this lesson from us and they had learned it very well. Many people then in Korea, particularly uh, in government circles, realized that something had to change now, right? The, the Western empires were very powerful. Japan was very powerful and was behaving in a very aggressive way. So something had to change, right? They had to figure out some way to deal with these new empires that had these very, very powerful weapons. And, um, and we saw through the Konkwa forts where, you know, this very important fort, the Japanese had, had been fairly able, able to take fairly easily right, despite Korean bravery. So there was a question about how much Korea should reform. Um, on the left, you see um, Empress uh, Myung-sung, also known as Queen Min, and she thought Korea should follow limited reforms, and in particular, it should look to China. China had engaged in a form um, of reforms called self-strengthening, which basically held that, you know what, if we buy some guns and build a few factories, we don't really need to change our society. We don't need to change our political structure or much of anything like that. That will make us powerful enough to deal with the, the empires. In contrast, you have people um, on the right, like Kim il kyun who said, um, you know what? We need radical reform. We need to be more like Japan, right? And this points to kind of a problem that Koreans faced. You know, they, they had this very difficult issue to deal with first. How do you reform your country? Um, how do you undertake modernization? How do you do in a very short time what took hundreds of years for Western countries to do? Right? How do you do that, first of all? And, and people can differ about that. But also what happened in Korea was different approaches were connected to different countries. And what would happen is each of these different groups would look to those foreign countries for support. Right? So Queen Min, Empress Myung-sung would look to China for help. The progressives um, who wanted radical reform would look to Japan for help. And I'll just give you one example how this can get, get become really a problem. In 1884, the progressives uh, felt that they were kind of under threat, that the more conservative group was uh, going to come after them. So with the help of the Japanese, um, some Japanese government officials, the pro-Japanese radical reform um, people in Korea launched a coup in which they killed some of the, the conservative people and managed to take control of the king. And they were backed by Japanese soldiers in doing this. In response, um, the Ch China, um, at the request of the Korean government, sent troops into Korea to force the Japanese out and uh, free the king. So we have here, right, Koreans, um, you know, having very different understandings of what their government should do, and then looking to foreign powers for support in doing that. Right. So this is this is kind of a situation. And to give you an idea, this actually inf affected An Chung Gun. His father was connected to a pro-Japanese progressive. And this is one thing I really want to emphasize. Um, An Chung Gun and his family were not anti-Japanese. Um, they were against Japan expanding uh, uh, expansionism. They didn't like Ito Hirobumi. They weren't anti-Japanese. Um, An Chung Gun's father, An Tae Hoon, was connected to a progressive pro-Japanese reformer who was connected to the Kop Shin Ku. And because of that, An Chung-gun and his family had to flee Heiju, right, this important port city where An Chung-gun was, was born, flee into, um, basically into rural Huanghui province, where, um, into this village Chunggye-dong, or uh, Chunggye-jeon. So this impacted even on and his family.
Now, I'm going to go through the next few years very, very quickly, um, but we need to kind of understand the situation that An Chungun and other Koreans would face. Um, in 1885 to 1894, after the failure of the Kapshin coup, um, China really expanded its power into Korea. And in some ways, Korea was becoming um, almost at this time a part of China, right? If this would have continued, um, Korea maybe would have eventually become formally part of the Chinese empire. It really was expanding its power um, under the leadership of this man, Yun Shikai. However, a complex mixture of factors um, led to a rebellion in 1894, uh, which we call the Tonghak Rebellion because it was led by this religious group called the Tonghak, but in which many Koreans took place. And this rebellion had multiple causes, um, but it was mostly directed against the Korean government and foreigners, right? And what's key though, when I say the Korean government, not they didn't really want to overthrow the Korean government. They liked the king, um, but they didn't like the officials that were serving the king, and they blamed them for the oppression of their religion, and they also blamed um, them and foreigners for the changes that were happening in Korean society and the Korean economy because it's now been opened up to a global market. So this led to this, um, this rebellion. Now what ends up happening is um, at the request of the Korean king, China will send troops to help put down the rebellion because of a treaty that had been signed between Japan and China earlier. Japan also gets to send troops to help put down the rebellion. Um, and the rebellion will eventually be put down. Now, this is important because An Chung Gun actually and his father actually helped fight against the rebellion. Um, they were part of anti Tonghak forces because the Tonghak targeted them because they were wealthy people and the Tonghak were mostly peasants. And again, this is proof An Chung Gun was not anti Japanese. In fact, he points out in his autobiography how a Japanese um, officer um, basically recognized their contributions to putting down this rebellion. So now you have Chinese and Japanese troops on the peninsula, and eventually what will happen is Japan will attempt to use um, the reform of Korea as a justification for bringing more reforms to Korea, for bringing more change, which would of course be Japanese-style change and increase Japanese influence. The Chinese don't like that. They want to maintain their influence in Korea, and this will eventually lead to a war between Japan and Korea. I'm sorry, Japan and China. And what's key about this war is that, remember, China is associated with this kind of conservative reform. Japan is associated with radical reform. Japan will actually win the war, right? Little Japan will defeat this very, very powerful China. And this is something that will impact on Chungun a lot, right? Because he'll say, wow, you know, this is amazing. This little country was able to defeat this very powerful country. And that's actually one thing that made him admire Japan uh, in many ways, even if he didn't always like what the Japanese were doing. The Japanese victory then would allow them to ally with Korean progressives who wanted to bring radical reforms to Korea. And we call the reforms they brought the Cabo reforms. Now the Empress, um, Empress Myung-sung opposed many of these reforms, right? She was a conservative reformer. Uh, she was pro-Chinese. And the Japanese government responded, um, or I should say a Japanese official in Korea, um, a consul, responded by organizing a bunch of thugs and assassinating uh, the Empress, right? They actually, these these uh, group of uh, thugs uh, organized by the Japanese uh, government official just broke into her palace, killed her, um, one of her, her servants, and then a Korean official uh, with swords. So it was this very, very kind of dirty, nasty business. Uh, the assassination of the Empress deeply disturbed the king of Korea, King Kojong, and he would flee to the Russian legation and would be protected there. And since um, the Japanese had behaved in such a, a basically a dirty, underhanded manner by assassinating the queen, um, they were subjected to a lot of international criticism, and they basically lost power in Korea um, at this time. And the Russians gained power for a while, and it's complex why, but eventually the, the king, Korean king is able to leave the Russian legation and then be able to escape a lot of Russian influence. This will then lead to these um, years, 1897 to 1904, um, what we often call like the, the time of the Great Han Empire. The Han Empire would last longer than that. But basically, in order to assert his equality with other emperors, Korean, uh, King Kojong went from being a king to being an emperor. And the Korean government attempted to um, establish a lot of reforms, uh, reforms, in fact, that the Japanese government thought were so good that they would keep them going even after they annexed Korea.
So one thing they do, they would try and build railroads and streetcars and telegraph lines and those sorts of things. And this would go on for about seven years. Um, and this was a time when Korea was most open to reform in a sense, when it actually had a relatively free hand to try and bring that reform on its own. Now, the problem, of course, is seven years isn't a very long time, right? It's not enough time, in fact, to actually be able to strengthen your country enough to defend yourself from imperialism. So you might ask yourself, well, well, why 1904? What happens in 1904? Well, basically during this time, Russia was expanding its power. Remember I, I said how railroads are very important. Railroads allow you to move supplies and move troops. They also allow you to bring in, um, to establish new markets, to get access to new resources and such. And Russia was expanding its empire. It was building this, um, and its railroad system. It was building this thing called the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which would link uh, European Russia, particularly in Moscow, to its growing empire in the east. And this made Japan very nervous, right? You can see from this map, Russia's huge, right? The Russian empire is gigantic. Japan's not so big. And the Russian empire is becoming stronger in the east. And so many Japanese people were, were uh, becoming afraid, especially the Japanese government, about this expanding Russian empire. And the uh, Japanese uh, government repeatedly requested uh, and uh, Russia to back off, tried to find diplomatic solutions, and the Russian Empire just did not take Japan seriously. So in response, um, Japan attacked Russia, it launched a surprise attack in 1904, and much to the world's surprise was actually to do quite well against the Russian Empire. Basically every major battle, the Japanese were able to win. And um, I include this image here just to remind us that essentially what they're fighting over is who's going to be the preeminent power in Korea, right? Japan had defeated China um, as China was becoming this kind of this great power it, or was expanding its influence in Korea. And now Russia was coming to expand its influence in Korea and Japan's going to be fighting uh, in order to stop that, in order to increase its own power in Korea. And in 1905, um, Basically, what will happen is that Russia and Japan have become very tired out through this war, which killed a large number of, of people. And uh, they will agree to have a negotiated peace, which will give Japan a lot of what it wants, but it won't have any, they won't get any money from Russia or anything like that. And this is a peace that is, nego and the re reason it's called the Treaty of Portsmouth is it was mediated by um, American President Theodore Roosevelt um, in Portsmouth, which is in the United States. So this, um, and this is an astounding thing for many Koreans, uh, for many people throughout the world, that a yellow power, right, Japanese people, yellow people were able to defeat a white empire, right? And this made many Koreans, including on Chungun, uh, have a lot of respect for Japan. But while An Chungun and many Koreans were um, impressed and many Chinese too by the Japanese victory, they weren't so happy with the peace, right? The um, for one thing, the Treaty of Portsmouth said that um, it recognized that Japan had predominant interests in Korea, which is something that An Chungun was going to be very, very ha um, unhappy about. And also, as part of the Russo-Japanese War, Japan is going to force Korea to sign a treaty in 1905 that will give Japan a lot of power in Korea, right? They want to make sure that they had this kind of formal relationship with Korea so they can't be pushed out so easily as they had been back in 1895, 1896. And as part of establishing a colonial government in Korea, in 1906, Ito Hirobumi is sent as resident general of Korea. And one thing I, I have to stress about this guy, I mean, if, you, if you're not familiar with Japanese history, he was the framer of the Japanese constitution. He basically wrote the Japanese constitution, which I spoken of earlier. So he's kind of like the James Madison of Japan. Um, he had also served as prime minister multiple times, including during the time when Japan fought China and uh, won in its victory against China. And so he's a very important politician, very important government figure. And you can that shows how important Japan sees Korea in this time period. Um, and he's a complex guy. He was more moderate in many ways than um, than some of the, especially some of the more military figures in the Japanese government. He wasn't near, he was not nearly as racist as some other Japanese towards Koreans, but he was still an imperialist. And while he really was, I think, sincerely interested in helping Korea, he still was mostly interested in seeing to Japanese interests, right? He wanted to, it was for him, Japan first. Now, what's going to happen is he's, he comes to, um, to Korea to set up this new colonial government 
um, as resident general, and he hopes to bring a lot of reform. But the problem is, first of all, a lot of these reforms are really meant to help Japan and encourage Japanese influence and Japanese power. Um, and so Koreans would frequently resist his reforms, right? Both because they help the Japanese, but just the fact that he's there is a problem because it damages Korean sovereignty. This idea that we need this resident general to tell us what to do, right? We have a king, or now he's an emperor, you know, we can kind of do things ourselves. So Koreans will frequently resist this, which will hurt um, because it hurts their sovereignty and because these reforms are often meant to help Japanese people first. And the problem is at least this kind of cycle where Ito um, will use more and more force, become more and more aggressive to push through his reforms, causing Koreans to resist more, causing him to use more force. And so many Koreans become really, really anti Ito Hirobumi because he's understood quite rightly and as the person who's really reducing Korea's sovereignty. So now we can we can really bring An Chungun back into the story, right? We started off with An Chungun, then we talked about these uh, these various issues that Korea had um, was facing uh, the, uh, through Japan and through the Western empires. But now we can talk about An Chungun. So An Chungun traces in his autobiography his political awakening to the Russo-Japanese War, and he traces it to a man named Father Joseph Wilhelm a uh, missionary, Catholic missionary, who, who had actually baptized him and, and who said after the end of the Russo-Japanese, or during the Russo-Japanese War, uh, the priest said to An, you know what, it doesn't matter who wins, it's going to be bad for Korea because whoever's going to win is basically going to take over Korea. And uh, this gave An Chungun, who had previously just mostly been interested in local affairs, became very interested in national and international affairs, right? He developed this kind of sense of crisis, and this led him to begin to study, to try and understand what was going on. And so he'll take part in many of the famous, um, what, was, what in Korea is called the Patriotic Enlightenment Movement, um, to try and help strengthen Korea. He'll become, he'll help support and manage and even teach at some schools uh, that are run by the, that are also associated with the Catholic Church. He was a very devout Catholic. He'll also try and um, invest in a coal mine in hopes of developing Korea's uh, industry and making money that Koreans can use to reform. Um, Korea had also gone into debt um, to the Japanese, and there was a hope, uh, there was a fear rather, that the Japanese could, um, like the British in Egypt, use debt as an excuse to take over uh, Korea. So there was a debt repayment movement, and An Jingun took part in that. And these are all great things that would have really strengthened Korea, but Korea had little time, right? Korea did not have much time uh, in order to kind of reform itself. So what do I mean when I say that Koreans had little time? Well, as I just mentioned a bit ago, Ito Hirobumi was forcing these reforms through uh, the Korean government, uh, which impeded on Korean sovereignty. And often these reforms, um, they were more aimed at helping Japanese rather than helping um, Korea, and that naturally Koreans resisted that. And one instance of that resistance was led by Emperor Kojong. Uh, Emperor Kojong in 1907 sent a Korean delegation to the Hague Peace Talks led by um, and this was assisted by the American uh, Homer Hulbert, and uh, with the idea of protesting the protectorate that Japan had forced Korea to accept. Um, basically, in that 1905 treaty I had mentioned briefly before, uh, Korea had been made into a protectorate of Japan, where Japan basically took control over Korea's diplomatic relations. And what this, um, uh, this kind of protest was meant to, to argue was that this had been illegal, and it had, Korea had been forced to accept this treaty, and that, and that was true. This, the Korea had been, the Korean government had, be, uh, quite a bit of coercion was used against the Korean government to force it to sign this um, treaty. So the problem was for the Koreans that the Japanese discovered this, and used, and uh, Ito Hirobumi used this as a justification to force Emperor Kojong to abdicate the throne. And then he, um, was succeeded by his son, Sun Jong. And Sun Jong, it's not clear what was the matter with him, but he was a man of limited capacity. He just was not mentally capable of resisting Japan. And then Ito Hirobumi through Emperor Sun Jong made sure that um, many pro-Japanese Korean government officials would be appointed to the government, giving them control and making sure the Korean government, rather than resisting them, would, would cooperate with Ito. And then they signed um, uh, the Korean government was forced then to sign a new treaty that gave Japan even more power, and Ito Hirobumi uh, also forced the Korean army to disband, right? 
So now we're, and this is, I think is very important, right? Because Korea has been, uh, and especially when we think about An Chung Gun, Korea has been forced to get rid of its army, right? And so the government cannot um, protect itself and cannot protect its people uh, because it no longer has an army, right? That's kind of a basic thing a state has. Um, Korea no longer has it. So how did An Chung Gun react to this? Well, a lot of the Korean soldiers in this disband, this army that had just been disbanded by Ito, um, they were patriotic, they were loyal to their government, and so they took their weapons and ran away and started to rage a guerrilla war, um, or what we call in Korea the kind of righteous army movement. Uh, these were uh, Lee Byung, uh, righteous army soldiers. So you had this group of Korean soldiers um, who started fighting against the Japanese using guerrilla tactics, and they were joined by other Koreans as well. And of course, An Chung Gun uh, was one of the people who would join, right? He realized that there wasn't time for the Patriotic Enlightenment movement to work. He realized that, that Japan had basically taken over the Korean government. And since Korea no longer had uh, a legitimate army, um, an active army, it made sense that the Korean people could form their own army, right? This is kind of a nationalistic stance to take, right? You know, we're the Korean people, we need to protect our state because we're the Korean nation, right? You can see the kind of nationalism here. So An will actually leave Korea um, and leave, leave Korea so that he can help organize an army outside of Korea, right? So he'll help form an army there. And so An Chung will take active part in the guerrilla movement. Um, his army, and he'll be appointed, I mean, he only leads a few hundred men, but he'll be appointed to the rank of Lieutenant General in that army. Uh, they will march into Korea they will fight uh, basically two battles. One is a victory, but they're defeated in the second battle and An's army is, is essentially destroyed, right? So um, An finds himself in kind of a particularly uh, difficult situation, right? He, um, in order to help his government, um, which has lost its army, he helped form and lead an army. Uh, it enjoyed some success, but was destroyed. So what's he supposed to do now, right? There's not time for the Patriotic Enlightenment movement to work. Um, there was an attempt to use military force to get Japan out of Korea. Um, that has not worked. So An Chung Gun is in this difficult situation. What should he do? So An Chung Gun faced a difficult situation. He was concerned about Korean um, independence, and he was also concerned about peace in the East. And so he could see problems, but it was hard to figure out what he could do about those problems. So he, he had a profound sense of frustration. And he talks about in his um, autobiography about being in Kraskino, a town in Russia. And he just all of a sudden had a feeling that he should leave. And he left and he went to Vladivostok. And while he was in Vladivostok, he heard a rumor that Itohi Robumi, who had retired from the uh, position of governor general by this time, was going to be going to Harbin. So An Chung Gun. Um, and this is kind of a long story that I won't get into here, but An Chung Gun found some other people who sympathized with him and eventually found his way to Harbin. They, they took some twists and turns to, to get there, but they did eventually get to Harbin with the idea, well, he went to Harbin, some of the other people went to other places, but he went to Harbin with the idea um, of doing something about these issues. And it's important for us though to kind of understand why Itohi Rubumi was going to Harbin. Right, um, Much was made at the time um, that An Chung Gun had killed Ito when he was no longer resident general. And that is a, an important point, but it's also important to note, and An Chung Gun himself realized this, that Ito Hirobumi was still a powerful politician, and he wasn't just going to, to Harbin and to this Manchuria for a pleasure trip. Uh, there was arguments um, about what should be done with Manchuria. Um, Manchuria was technically Chinese territory, but the northern part um, was basically um, had a lot of Russian influence um, and the southern part had growing Japanese influence and this was a point of future conflict possibly and Ito Hirobumi actually went to Harbin in part to meet with the Russian financial minister to talk about about these issues and about how they could divide this Chinese territory um, in a way that would, would not lead to conflict between them. So that's why Ito Hirobumi got to Harbin station, right? That's why he's going there, is in order to deal with um, with this issue, these issues in Manchuria. And I just want to note this image. Um, you can see there that there's, uh, at the top, there's a sign that notes this is where An Chung Gun shot Ito Hirobumi. There's the date that he shot him. 
and um, you can see that th there's two little differently colored stones. The one with an arrow is showing where Anjugun was standing, where he faced, and then the other one is where Itohirubumi was. And of course, as you can see from that last uh, slide, what Anjugun did about Itohirubumi was to shoot him, right? Uh, Anjugun being very concerned about Korean independence um, and peace in the East, uh, attempted to help Korea by developing its national strength um, and then later through the Patriotic Enlightenment movement and then later when it became clear there wasn't time for that to work he decided that it was necessary to turn to violent um, resistance and he did that through the Righteous Army movement and then when that failed um, he still saw himself as a soldier he saw Ito Hirobumi as the prime enemy of Korea and then he approached and shot him um, and so this is the first in a series of lectures that I'm recording. Um, I have here tried to explain how um, the, the times and the, the fa uh, An Chungun's family situation so we could better understand why he acted the way he did um, and why Japan also acted the way they did and, and just like I said the general international situation. For my next lecture we're going to study and to discuss a little bit more about how the world reacted to what An Chung Gun did and to what he sought to do at his trial and how the characteristics of his trial.